We have Tony right here. Uh, Tony, do you want to tell us a bit about who you are and what you do? Yes, yeah, so I'm, an, I'm a consultant all day psychiatrist and I've been working in an area of South East London for the last 20, 21 years. Yeah. And my everyday job is to see people at home with mental health problems. They're usually over the age of 65, although well, there are some people who are younger who may have dementia. Okay. Okay, thank you for that introduction and I am Julie Breslin, Head of Programme for Drinkwise Age Well, uh, which is a national lottery funded programme. We have 18 partners across five UK sites um, and we provide a number of different activities including one-to-one -one support and intervention through home visits and outreach like yourself, awareness raising, skills development and, and working with people around resilience and improving social connections. Um, so it's great to sit and chat with you today, Tony. Um, Firstly, in general, what made you want to become a psychiatrist that specialised in older adults? Okay, well, the re I can tell you the reason I became a psychiatrist is because my mother is a psychiatrist, or was a psychiatrist before she retired, and my, my father was a community geriatrician, so it's almost like it was in the blood. Now, in terms of old age psychiatry, I saw it as quite a challenge, and the, the challenge being that you've got a person with both physical and mental health problems, mm -hmm. and it's that in, sort of interplay between the two that means that there's so many factors going on in people's lives and in their health that no two people are the same, and that's why I, I chose that. It's very challenging. Mm -hmm. I, I can imagine, I can imagine. And the area of London that you work in, London yes. also experience very, very high levels of deprivation, so there's an added um, health inequalities in, in that community. That's right. Um, so as one of the, the authors, co-authors of the Invisible mm. Addicts Report, mm. which uh, obviously came out in 2011 and then we had a refresh last year, um, why do you think it's important that we have specialist support for older adults in relation to alcohol use? Well, just, so just going back with the Invisible Addicts, so the Invisible Addicts Report was released in 2011 and I think what stood out from that was the need to look at older people in a very different light. So one of the, the headline grabbers from that was looking at older people having lower cut-offs for unhealthy drinking, and that caused quite a stir. But what it detracted from were the other messages in the report that there's a growing population of baby boomers, mm -hmm. we can come on to what that, what that population means and who they are, who are drinking more than that age group was, say, 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so with that comes the need to develop specialist skills and that's what Ad Action is doing, that's what Drinkwise Age Well is doing. The need to train people up who have the specialist skills to be able to detect the alcohol misuse. Because largely speaking the alcohol misuse in this age group is going unnoticed, uh, unrecognised and if you don't ask the right questions people are going to bottle up and they're not going to present to you in the way that you can identify as being representative of a group that needs your help. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you just made a point there about when, you, when the report first came out, obviously there was one issue that everybody jumped on, which was about lowering the threshold yes. around alcohol units, um, which is still an important point. Mm. Uh, do you want to talk a wee bit about why, why there mm. is that recognition that older adults are maybe more vulnerable to, to the effects of alcohol use? Yes. It's, it's, it's quite complicated, but there, there are certain things that are different about older people. Mm -hmm. So when uh, an older person has the same amount to drink as a younger person, uh, they can't get rid of the alcohol in their blood as quickly as younger people can. Uh, they also, for, for a given amount of alcohol, the concentration of alcohol in their blood is higher. So it's those sort of things. Now, as if that wasn't enough, you've got other things going on with older people, such as they may have a lot of medical problems, they may have high blood pressure, they may have diabetes, they may have an increased sensitivity in their brain if they've got conditions, if they've got disorders or, or problems like memory, memory impairment and dementia. Mm. So if you look at all those sensitivities, on average it means an older person is more sensitive to the effects the same amount of alcohol as a younger person would do. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and, and so the, the recommendation was 11 units for um, men and women aged over 65, yes. is that right? Yeah. Um, and the current units are 14 units. That's right. To put that into, into um, context. Um, so in, in terms of the changes in alcohol use in this population, yes. we talk about the baby, baby mm, boomers, mm. Um, what, what do you think those changes have been in the last 10 or 20 yeah. years? Well, so with the baby boomers, we're talking about a group of people, a group of older people, who are now in between 50 and 55. They're, they're sort of in their mid-50s. And they were born between the years 1946 and 1964. 
And what we've seen with that population, and we don't quite understand why, we think it might be because of the, the influences they had when they were growing up in terms of alcohol being much more acceptable, getting drunk more acceptable, etc. that whichever way you look at it, whichever statistics you want to look at with this, this baby boom population, we're looking, for example, at uh, high rises in the number of people in alcohol treatment, that's specialist services, whether they're commissioned through the third sector or whether they're commissioned through specialist NHS services. We're looking at higher uh, rates of alcohol-related hospital admissions. We're looking at higher rates of alcohol-related deaths. We're looking at also higher rates of people drinking above lower low risk limits. So whichever way you want to cut it in terms of the statistics or the data, we're looking at a population at risk and we clearly are not meeting their needs. Uh, so some people would argue that, that our population is increasing anyway, yes. it's an, an ageing population, and yeah. so this, these, these increasing harms are just reflective of that. Yeah. Do you think that's, that's oversimplifying? The well, not really. So I was prepared for this. When, when, as I've been, looking, I've been looking at this data for about 10, 15 years every year, and each time I see a few percentage increases in the, the percentage of people over, the number of people over, over 50 or the number of people over 65, whichever way I want to measure it, but that's outpaced by sort of 10, 20 percent increases per year. Yeah. And, and so, for example, over the last 15 years, with alcohol-related admissions, we're looking at we're looking at between 50 and 100 percent increases in, in, in numbers. Yeah. And the numbers aren't small; there are hundreds, or sometimes there are thousands. Mm. Uh, but we're also looking at that in terms of uh, people coming into specialist treatment. We're looking at 200, 300 percent increases. Mm. So, which, whichever way you want to look at it. We're talking at, at increases that are ten, or, ten times or more greater than the actual rise the in population. Rise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's something bigger there, and I mean, obviously, right. we've also seen increase in alcohol harm across the population in all ages, related to yes. about affordability and, mm -hmm. and accessibility That's as well, right. which is which is a big factor. And certainly culturally, I think, um, as you say, even, even when I was growing up, I, you know, I would, you know, in the 70s, that mm. that it was it was a rare treat for my parents to have a bottle of yes. wine on a Saturday night, yes. whereas that's now become just, you know, much right. more the general of the shop. The shop that's is right. there, so people have their baskets, they're going in and picking up more wine, so it's, it's much more, um, yeah. And, and even, in, even in public now, when I listen to, I mean, I've been on jury service recently, I've been, I, I sit in trains, I sit in buses, and whoever I talk to, unfortunately, the people who are telling me they're drinking half a bottle of wine a day or sharing a bottle with their, with their partner, for example, is, is usually going to be, unfortunately, someone in their 50s or above. Yeah. Um, and we just don't see younger people drinking to the same extent as we say did uh, mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30 years ago. And, and, and on that point then, in terms of this population, do you think this is people mostly that have been drinking throughout their life, mm. but it's starting to become a problem as they go into their 50s and 60s? Yes. Um, or do you think there's also a, a, you know, a number of people that maybe are what we would call late onset drinkers yep. who have developed alcohol problems? And what, mm. what's the difference do you think about between those two groups? So those yes. that have been drinking for quite a long time yep. and those that have developed problems at later life? Well, very often the group who, who have, have been drinking heavily in the past, before they were, they were in, their, in their 50s and so on, I suppose that that group is usually men and they probably fall into two categories. They're, 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 well, three maybe. They're those who have been uh, drinking unhealthily, so they may have been drinking uh, above 14 units per week, but yeah. probably less than less than 35 units a week, for example. And then they have some life events, for example, uh, or, or a health problem, and then they start to drink more. Mm -hmm. Or you've got people who maybe drank a lot in their 20s, 20s as an example, and then they had a very stable relationship. Maybe they were they, they had a family, and then they they start to, to, to drink more heavily. But perhaps more importantly, the people we often miss, and these are probably the people who may present in casualty or present, say, as a referral to our team, and they're usually women, are the people who maybe start to drink for the first time in later life. Mm -hmm. And that's very often in, not in relation to the kind of problems that younger people may have, say problems with their, with their marriage, problems with drink driving, problems with um, uh, offences in public, like getting yeah. into fights and so yeah. on. It's very often the older women who may have had a bereavement, mm -hmm. they may have chronic health problems, they may not be able to get out, they may be socially isolated, or they may simply uh, be mixing their medication 
which is not safe to take with alcohol. Which is increasing the risk for them that, anyway. That's right. Yeah. And very often in our experience, people that you're talking about here are drinking at home alone. They're not that's right. very, and they're very hidden. Hidden. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Which brings me on to another question then. Mm. What do you think are the biggest barriers yeah. around um, treatment for older adults and, and substance misuse in general? Mm. Mm. But it's, it's very complicated. There's so many different barriers at every single level that we look at. We see a group of people who are not getting the services they deserve. So. If you, if you look at the very the very tip of that iceberg, it's the, it's the detection. So the assessment of people with with substance misuse, whether whether it be uh, taking well, misusing alcohol, using misusing alcohol, whether it be misusing painkillers which contain opioid drugs, or, or or it could be things like cannabis, for example. And cannabis at the moment is running a close second to alcohol in increased rates of misuse in, in older people. So for example, you've got GPs who have little time and little training. You have, uh, say, medical doctors who are sitting in outpatients who haven't got time to concentrate on alcohol. They're far too busy looking at maybe things like stroke, Parkinson's disease, other physical problems, and that gets hidden. Uh, you, you might have a, a, a problem where people just don't have the specialist skills, and I think that's what we're doing with Dream Wise Age. Well, they don't have the specialist skills to be able to detect things like depression, to be able to detect things like cognitive impairment. So that there are barriers, and of course the, the other barriers are that we often tend to see people in uh, outpatients as a, uh, from a medical perspective. Mm -hmm. And with, with my service we see people at home, you get a much clearer idea of what their problems are. But lastly I think there's a problem with what I call, uh, what I'm going to call commissioning for complexity. Mm -hmm. And that is getting the resources out there to deal with the, the complex problems that older people with alcohol problems and substance misuse alcohol misuse and substance misuse often have and they often fall between the very very complex so people with complex mental health problems and, and substance misuse uh, to people where where it might be more suitable to have say peer to peer support work and might be talking about uh, groups might be talking about smart recovery so so that commissioning for complexity has to involve I think both health social care but also the third sector absolutely and absolutely and one of those issues i think is also that the, the, the you know the, the needs are so complex mm. that the setting for treatment often is considered that the only option is residential or that's or right rehab mm. Mm. and it means that the options for community support um, are reduced so that yeah. that you know there's nothing that's designed to meet the needs of older adults yes. so the other thing that we often see as well is just just professional attitudes unfortunately which we, we saw um, yes. from our survey in the calling time report well that's one thing too late for people to change Absolutely. or yeah, the damage is already done mm. is, is is something that we probably come up quite yes. regularly uh, within our work and also uh on that because i forgot to mention that there there is a there is a, an ageism from very very different parts of our society. So, so you could get collusion from relatives, like the only thing they've got in their mind, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. You could get doctors thinking, so for example, that even if I do detect something, what's the point? There's very little I can do. Yeah. Uh, and th as a society, we've still got this whole idea, which, I, 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 which some people call otherism, that it's not a problem for older people, it's a problem for younger people. And that's what older people often say that it's not my problem. You might have found that in statistics, but it's not my problem. Yeah. And a lot of the recent literature that's still coming out is finding that old people are quite blasé about their health problems. They may identify they've got health problems, but they don't want to do very much about it. And that's the problem with baby boomers that we have at the moment. Mm -hmm. that the fact that even if people do, do acknowledge and are aware of their health problems, they really don't think that there's much that can be done about it. And that's very sad. And is there factors that we can look at as motivating with an older population? And things like longer term independence, being more independent, yeah. or um, you know, being a less risk of falls or injury, and, yeah. and trying to find other ways to motivate people to to, to change behaviour around alcohol use. I think so. I think I think the sort of problems that old people have with their health, if you can get them to see, for example, that the medication doesn't mix with the alcohol, yeah. if you get them get them to see that, that drinking too much might leads to falls because you've either got poor balance or poor eyesight uh, or, or something like that yeah. or get them to see that their brain's more sensitive or that it might be causing causing some problems such as um, memory problems or cognitive impairment. Which brings me on very yes. well to the next question, <laughs> Tony, thanks yeah. for that. So, so you're currently working with Drink Wise as well um, and, and I've already um, delivered some excellent training to our staff around alcohol related cognitive impairment. So why do you think this is important? 
Well, I suppose the first thing to, is, is, is to say what is alcohol related cognitive impairment. And alcohol related cognitive impairment is a range of problems that people have as a consequence of several years of heavy drinking. Now, for some people it could be five years, for some people it could, it could be ten years. And those sort of problems involve uh, difficulties with things like memory, difficulties with things like judgment, and that could be judgment over finance, it could be judgment over, over the health care that they're receiving. Uh, and it could be problems such as planning their day. Uh, or, or getting lost in unfamiliar surroundings. So, so it does present with a variety of things. They, pe people could, for example, forget where they put things as a result of uh, the, the cognitive impairment. They could lose their way in unfamiliar surroundings. Uh, they could have problems managing their job, for example. You know, a lot of people over 50 still work, managing their job, managing driving. So those, those are the problems. Uh, and. Why is it a problem? It's a problem because it's underdetected and it's underrecognised. And the reason it's underrecognised is because very often people who've been drinking a lot may be misperceived as not having cognitive impairment because it gets hidden with things like depression, it gets hidden in things like intoxication. Uh, and therefore, if you've got someone with, who's slowed up or someone who's permanently intoxicated, you're not going to give them the chance to be assessed. When, when you have that window of opportunity to assess them, mm -hmm. to be able to detect cognitive impairment. So I think that's the, the, those are the main barriers, and that's the reason why we're not detecting it as well as we could. And, yes. So, so just to understand that, are you yeah. saying then that, that actually we, people are maybe not screened for an, um, a cognitive impairment because they're still actively drinking and the screening can't yes. be done, but are you saying that, that we could be screening people at that point? I think, able I think to we could, yes. properly adapt how we work with them? Absolutely. So, for example, some memory services don't see people unless they've been they've been sober or abstinent, which I think is a bit much to ask, and I'd be yes, unfair. Yes. For three months, for example, uh, some uh, uh, say all these psychiatry services don't have the skills, but they still say won't see won't see people uh, mm -hmm. until until they're sober for for a certain length of time. But the people that I've seen in my service. I, I, I'm, I'm 100% sure that I can make a valid assessment of someone, even if they're continuing to drink, when they have that lucid period when they're sober. So for example, in the morning if you catch them and you, and you do a cognitive screen. So you would think then, wouldn't you probably, that, that if, it, if, it, if it was clouded by their intoxication, then they'd be scoring across the range very low. Mm. But that's not it. You see, the, pro the, the thing is, when we do go and see these people, and they are cooperative, and we do manage to get a valid assessment, we do feel that they score poorly in some areas more than they do in other areas, which would give weight to the idea that there is a differential way of distinguishing what's the alcohol related quantum impairment yes. uh, in terms of the assessment that you do and, and that's irrespective of factors such as intoxication or depression. Yes. So I, I'm, I'm sure that we can do that. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's important because you were then able to think about how we best support that person. And that's as right. you know, in Drinkwise Age Well we screen using the Montreal Cognitive Assessment yes. Screening Tool mm -hmm. and uh, just under 50% of people that we have scored have, have, have had a mild to, um, to moderate uh, cognitive impairment. So from a practitioner point of view, mm. uh, not necessarily health, social care mm -hmm. or health, what kind of things can you do to adapt interventions if you feel that somebody has got a cognitive impairment? So, yeah, so you, what you've mentioned is, and what we both mentioned is, that, that there is cognitive impairment related to alcohol use, and that cognitive impairment very often tends to be around specific areas like memory and around what we call frontal lobe function. Now that's the jargon for saying that there are changes in people's personality, there are changes in people's behaviour uh, as part of that personality change, there are changes in people's ability to plan ahead. Uh, so for example, if you can get someone to stop or cut down, you, you might be able to partially reverse some of those some of those areas, so improve their memory, yeah. so they've got uh, a better ability to manage their everyday things. So th this is all about improving lives, improving, mm -hmm. improving people's ways of functioning. If you so so if you've got someone in the, in the very mild stage of alcohol release of cognitive impairment, they might be able to revert to a level of living that that where where you can support them. Yeah. There may be people who've got perhaps more moderate to severe needs where although there's been some reversibility, you might be able to uh, assist them and add interventions to them. For example, we've been doing a lot of training around what's called cognitive rehabilitation, and that involves uh, 
helping people, say, planning their day and correcting the errors that they might otherwise have because of their cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. So we can, we, can, we can look at things from the perspective of people making changes in their lives themselves and helping them to do that, from uh, thinking about their drinking, reflecting on their drinking, and keeping a diary, for example, uh, using that diary to be able to inform how much they drink over the course of a week, uh, each day. Um, and they might even be the kind of people who may then engage better with, say, a support worker to go out uh, and that's a sort of form of harm reduction, to be away from the drink, where they've got more constructive activities. And I know that Drink Wise Age One has been doing a lot of that community reinforcement work. Mm. On the more severe end, you've got the opportunity to, to minimise risk with uh, uh, increasing the amount of care in the home, uh, you might be able to, to, to give them uh, adaptations to, to daily living. So, so that might prevent them from having fires in their house, for example, if they smoke, uh, stop them getting locked out, for example. So assistive technology. Yeah. So there's a very large range of interventions. Continuous. That's right. How you respond. That's right. And, and I mean, it, it, from our, us, that we obviously do a, a mock screen at, at the point that somebody's leaving our service. Yes. And you've seen that those who have scored positive mm -hmm. um, in our market, a third of them, um, you know, have improved at, at the end. So that, mm, that improvement is a really important message to get across. Mm. But on the flip side, where maybe somebody has stopped drinking or reduced their drinking or addressed those issues, and there is an ongoing issue, it allows you then to say that this could be something that needs further exploration. It could be something more, you know, that we need to consider longer term or something more organic. Would you Would you agree with that? I would. I suppose the other difficulty is the other difficulty is that that. that if you look at if you look at problems in isolation, you don't get the whole picture because that's the, the, the reason I'm saying that is if you've got someone who drinks heavily, very often they might have also fallen over and damaged their brain through that. They they may have had developed high blood pressure and had small strokes in their brain. Now that requires further investigation. Yeah. And if memory services and so on are saying we're not going to see people because they continue to drink, I think that that is flying in the face of common sense when you want to. Uh, implement harm reduction yeah. uh, techniques, and and so there's a, there's a lot that you can do there from the medical side, uh, uh, treat medical problems, so so like hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, you might be able to give medication uh, that, uh, so for example, there are drugs called cholinesterase inhibitors that we give to people with Alzheimer's disease. They might be useful in alcohol-related certain forms of impairment mm -hmm. and dementia. So I think if, if, if we get agencies working in, in in synchrony and integrated, and I think we've, we've won the. And I think that's important where, where those health improvements are, you know, issues are being identified, and mm. maybe more likely than that, that person will respond to the alcohol intervention yes. itself. So all of that becomes yes. really, really important to be, to be that's realistic. Right. So, so, in terms of alcohol related cognitive impairment, our, what's our key messages then? That, you know, so, so screening is, is important um, to first identify the issue. Um, so as we're saying, we can adapt interventions yes. so that there's more chance that person gets the best um, possible uh, engagement with exactly. the program, um, and that you know we should be working really closely in partnership across the different pathways and and you know healthcare, social care, and voluntary sector to support people best we can. Do you think Absolutely, I, and, I, and I think I think all these things that you've mentioned that we've been talking about have the capacity to improve people's lives, so they live much more much more wholesome and successful lives for whatever lifespan they've got left and, and, and it's wholly possible through the work that Drink Wise Age One is doing. Yeah, yeah, and I mean and that has to be the message that you know it's never too late to change. It's never too late to change. In fact, you know, older adults sometimes do better in treatment and alcohol treatment than any other right. age group. Right. When they do engage, although you know the, a lot of those health harms can be reduced or lessened. Um, and you know they, they deserve that opportunity as much as any other age group. And um, well thanks so much. It was lovely to okay. chat to me and uh, yeah we'll see you soon thank you